I'd like to call the regular session of the City of Crescent City Council meeting to order and we can have the record reflect that all five council members are in attendance. Um, is there anything to report out of closed session, Mr. Black? Madam Mayor, no final actions were taken in closed session. Thank you. Um, Mr. Nia, Council Member Nia, would you say the Mayor Pro Tem and Nia, would you say the biggest thing? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hey, we'll move on to acknowledgments, and we have a very special acknowledgment, the swearing in of police officer Anthony Lopez. Chief, are you ready? We're taking it out of or, uh, order, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Evening. Evening. Uh, would Anthony Lopez please come up here and his father, Robert Lopez? Honorable City Council members, staff, distinguished guests. The Crescent City Police Department would like to introduce to you to the newest police officer added to our ranks, Anthony Lopez. Anthony grew up in Eureka, California, graduating from Eureka High School in the year 2000. Interesting enough, he continued his education by earning the associate's degree from the Western Culinary Institute in 2006. Yes, he's a chef. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but he soon realized that he has a passion for law enforcement. He graduated from the College of the Redwoods Police Academy in the year 2008. To demonstrate his work ethic and his drive for success, Anthony even worked as a part-time cook for the Humboldt County Correctional Facility while attending the police academy, which is a very difficult thing to do. Anthony was a police officer with the Rio Dell Police Department for a year. And when Rio Dell fell on hard economic times, like a lot of cities, he was laid off. Amazingly enough, he continued to be loyal and true to his department as Anthony continued to work as a reserve officer by working shifts, covering the streets, so that the other full-time officers were able to take time off or go on vacations with their families for no compensation. He would go down to the College of the Redwoods Police Academy to again volunteer his time with the police cadet curriculum. And it is at that time that he informed me of his desire to work for the Crescent City Police Department. Some of the reasons why his goals to work for the city is because he has found it as a close-knit group of employees and enjoys that setting very much. The training opportunities, as well as some of the specialized units available to him to enhance his career, was also appealing. Anthony would then make a nuisance of himself by showing up during the times when I instructed at the academy just to show me that he was still around and interested when there was a police officer position available. To me, a trait that displays drive and determination. Anthony would also ride around with the officers and has become a fixture at the department, and the officers enjoy his company. Anthony, you will find, is very friendly and enjoys interacting with people in a positive and a professional manner. I found him to be a caring person and enjoys the helping aspects of law enforcement, which is one of the traits for officers on the Crescent City Police Department. Anthony has a very low key and controlled manner about himself while displaying a consistent and professional demeanor and is capable of projecting an effective command presence while showing empathy and possesses the good interactions with the community, which is another trait necessary to be successful here. Therefore, I'm very proud and pleased to be able to offer Anthony Lopez a position on the Crescent City Police Department. Anthony is currently involved in and is expected to be satisfactorily complete a thorough and intensive 16-week field training officer program with Officer Justin Gill, who he himself bakes cakes 
and I know they will talk about police work and not exchange recipes or go into a wedding planning business. Right, Anthony? But all kidding aside, Anthony's character traits has proven work ethics and his dedication to the field of law enforcement as well as all the other qualities he's possessed. And we are looking forward to him as being a police officer. Once he gets through his police training, I believe he will serve the public as a reliable and dependable police officer, one with a strong sense of duty to the department as well as the community. Anthony has requested that his father, Robert Lopez, pin his badge on them. So therefore, Anthony, raise your right hand, please. I, in your name, do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support and defend, support and defend the, Constitution of the, United States the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California, the Constitution of the State of California against, all enemies, foreign and domestic, against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California, that I take this obligation freely Without any, mental reservation without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, or purpose of evasion. and that I will well and, I will well and, faithfully, discharge and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Police officer for the city of Crescent City. This is always the fun part. <laughs> to the citizens of Crescent City, I present to you Officer Anthony Lopez to the Crescent City Police Department. start over here with council member slurt uh, mr. Lopez welcome we need you <laughs> Anthony after uh, wearing that badge for eight years at the Christmas City Police Department I welcome you aboard and I'm sure you're doing a good job welcome Anthony and um, the parents your parents must be very proud so you can come back and visit us anytime you want maybe Anthony will cook for us mm -hmm. <laughs> Congratulations, welcome aboard, and thank you, Mr. Lopez, for raising such a fine son. Congratulations. Very good. Thank you. It's me in the back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Too. We are moving um, the item number three under acknowledgments to the end of the meeting. So we'll move on to the consent calendar. Any questions or clarifications from council members? Madam uh, Mayor, I'd move to approve the consent calendar as submitted. I, I did wanna make one note of one item uh, in the consent calendar and that, I'm sorry, it's later. Okay. Uh, I had some uh, corrections. Uh, did you did you fill out the form that our city clerk included in our no, binders? I'm sorry, I didn't. I'm not going to mention the name spelling corrections. I'm Thank just going to mention the. Um, from 11 21 11 uh, 
City Council items, Council Member Cert mentioned that he was approached by two elderly people. Uh, he didn't bother naming them, um, and I wanted to just indicate that it's my understanding it was Mrs. Uh, Kelly Shalong's mother that was involved. Um, also under um, Donna, if I might, um, it's it's usually I, I don't know of, it, uh, of us correcting other people's comments. So if there's a mistake that was made, but okay, I stand corrected. Uh, on no, uh, December the fifth, under communications, Daniel Kelly spoke about his interactions with two women for recall petition signatures. Actually, uh, that should be corrected that he accused Slurt of lying about the interaction and slandering him. And then um, later, there's a note here that Council Member Shalong spoke about um, Westfall approaching residents at the Donna, Hospital. Again, Donna, these are other people's comments, so um, you don't really have. Um, a position to correct other people's comments unless there's a mistake in something that you said or something that was on the agenda. Okay, I stand corrected. I'll second the motion. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you. We'll move on to communications. This is public comment period. Any member of the audience is invited to address the City Council on any matter that is within the jurisdiction of the City of Crescent City. Comments of public interest or on public matters or on matters appearing on the agenda are accepted. Note, however, that the Council is not able to undertake extended discussion or an act on non-agendized items. Such items can be referred to staff for appropriate action either before a meeting at City Hall or after. And you may include placement on, they may include placement on a future agenda. Any comments that are not at the microphone are out of order and will not be part of the public record. After receiving recognition from myself, please state your name and if you're a city or county resident for the record and limit your comments to three minutes. Is there any public comment? Mr. Miles? Miss Murray, I have a deep concern. And let me explain my concern at the best level that I can. And I promised Chief Plack that I wouldn't go berserk over this. Uh, in my neighborhood, there are two dogs. These dogs have become a nuisance. It's becoming so bad that at night, sometimes I can't go to sleep even though I take two sleeping pills because these dogs constantly bark. They have barked so much, they even have given my police chief migraine headaches. I have called the county animal control more than once for them to come by and talk to the owner. Guess what? No response. My city pays the county quite a bit of money each year for animal control. I deeply believe we're not getting the service we're paying for. I'm requesting tonight that my city declare these two dogs a public nuisance and do something about them. The owners, even when you ask them nicely to do something about their dogs, ignore the general public. Their living conditions, the backyard where they live, is a joke. If I, well, I can't say that, <laughs> but something needs to be done. And I don't know what the solution is. Is it time that we go back that my own 
city has its own animal control? We're not getting a service that we're paying for. We're wasting the taxpayers' money. Thank you. Is there other public comment? Um, before she comes up, I'd like to just say one thing. When I lived in Southern California, there were two German shepherds Donna, on us too. Donna, we, we, we don't comment. We don't have a like discussion and dialogue during public comment. Well, doesn't it say extensive discussion and dialogue? Can I have two minutes to just make a remark? Certainly, go ahead. Uh, two German shepherds would jump over the fence and they were killing all the cats in the neighborhood. And even though complaints were made, nothing was done. And then they killed our cat. And I was thinking, if they're killing our cat, what would happen if an infant happened to be out? So we called animal control. They came out. They destroyed the dogs. Thank you. That's what happened. Thank okay. you. Other public comment? Hi. My name is Amy Bradley, and I live in the city. I am one of the signature gatherers on your recall. Last council meeting, I demanded an investigation into the ethics violation by member, council members Slurt, Murray, and Shalong based on their statements made during November 21st council meeting, which I considered to be lies. I understand that no investigation will be made because the city does not have any policies or procedures in place. Therefore, I have asked my councilwoman, Donna Westfall, to hand in an agenda request form to do the following. Number one, create policies and procedures to handle ethics violations handed in to the city by constituents. Number two, then investigate the lies propounded by Slurt, Murray, and Shalong regarding the collection of signatures on Councilmember Slurt's recall. It's laughable that you strategic planning session calls for accountability <coughs> when I don't believe that you three understand what that means, along with honesty and integrity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there other public comment? Seeing none, I will close public comment and move on to item number nine, and we will adjourn to the Housing Authority. Let's state for the record that all five members are present. And I'll open it up for public comment. Um, Again, any member of the audience is invited to address the Housing Authority on any matter that is within the jurisdiction of the Crescent City Housing Authority. Comments of public interest or on matters not otherwise appearing on the agenda are accepted. Note, however, that the authority is not able to undertake extended discussion or to act on non-agendized items. Such items can be referred to staff for appropriate action, which may include placement on a future agenda. After receiving recognition from the chair, Please state your name for the record. Any comments that are not at the microphone will not be part of the public record. Is there any public comment for the Housing Authority? Mr. Miles. I want to thank the Housing Office and my city for doing something a few weeks ago. And that's painting the Housing Authority. But I believe it's nice to paint something, but when you overlook something else, you can't put lipstick on a pig. There, there is a landscape area in an alley next to the wall that our painters painted. With all the bark that my city is purchasing recently and all the fabric cloth that my city is putting around, you would think they wouldn't neglect 
the area by the housing office. My town is starting to look, well, it's in transition. And you only have to look at the Bank of America building. But when my city won't participate in making my city look better, I think that's sad. So I would hope my city would come up with a little money when they're buying all this bark and fabric cloth to do the housing authority. Thank you. Is there other public comment? Seeing none, I will close public comment and move to the consent calendar. Uh, move to approve <clears throat> as submitted. Second. Any questions or clarifications? Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Housing director's report, we have none. We have no public hearing. We have no continuing business or new business, so we will adjourn the Housing Authority regular meeting and move on to item number 10, which is the um, Sorry, I have uh, something misplaced here. Um, the Crescent City Redevelopment Agency. And please note that all five members are here. And public comment. Is there any public comment for the RDA? Mr. Miles. I have two questions. I'd like to know the current status of the lawsuit that the what is it, the thing that we belong to? The redevelopment agency? Yeah, and the status of the redevelopment a a agency. And then I would hope in the near future that this council would visit our historical society to look at some documents and photographs that are in their collection. And why I'm saying this, there is an architectural drawing there that goes back a number of years. It's an architect drawing of what a previous city council thought my downtown area should look like. It wasn't followed when we did the work downtown. And I think it should be revisited because if we're ever going to make our downtown area an area where businesses are welcome, tourists are welcome, and we can increase our sales tax. I think that drawing should be looked at. Thank you. Is there other public comment? Seeing none, I will close public <coughs> comment. Move to approve consent calendar items one and two. I would uh, second that. But I'd like to make a mention. Um, I think the citizens need to be aware that the um, Housing Authority and or the city is uh, uh, having to invest uh, our uh, monies into uh, legal fees for what I would consider a nuisance uh, lawsuit that was uh, put forward against the city and the redevelopment agency, uh, in this case by Mr. Barnes. And so uh, once again, the citizens are getting the short end of the deal. Um, your tax dollars are being spent to uh, defend uh, nonsense. It's unfortunate. Okay, is there any other questions for or clarifications? If not, um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Um, and then we'll. Uh, we have no um, executive director's report or new business items, so we will adjourn the redevelopment agency and move on to public hearings. 
And um, we have no public hearing, so we'll move on to reports. Item number 11, which <coughs> is a presentation by Fire Chief Steve Wakefield on the CCVFD mobile unit and report on El Patio burn. Chief, you, while you're coming up here, it was a fabulous exercise in burning down the El Patio, and you pulled it off without a hitch, so congratulations. Thank you. I think young Mr. Wakefield was responsible for a lot of that. Yeah, that was good. The whole team. Ryan Wakefield, who's uh, obviously my son. But anyway, he was a senior trainee in his uh, progress at state fire training um, to become a senior trainer for Fire Control 3A, which is what we did. Um, he is currently a certified fire trainer for a number of other classes that he teaches, um, both to the volunteers, but also at his work with his Pelican Bay. He's a fire captain there. so. Anyway, I brought him along because it's a good experience for him. And also, uh, I can answer questions maybe that I can't. Anyway, we'll start off here at the El Patio. Most of you might remember a shot similar to that, but that was Friday night. On Friday night, we, we did kind of an in-house exercise where we just used the city department and the uh, Crescent Fire Protection District. We didn't have everybody else there. We, we lit one building and then actually had a real response out of it of people responding so that they could actually go through that motion of being on an engine, stepping off an engine, pulling hose, looking to a hydrant, going through all the steps that we'd normally do. But it's hard to drill on oftentimes because usually some of that is accomplished at a real fire by the first four or five individuals there, so everybody got to see it. So that was a good uh, Friday night thing. Anyway, the instructors. Um, I want to make note of Darren McKinney from CAL FIRE and Jim Toy, who are senior instructors for the Fire Control 3A, and they donated their time to come to Crescent City and run this whole program for us. And their big thing was they were evaluators for not only Ryan, but also Darren Short and James Weiland, who were both captains with Crescent Fire Protection District, but they, um, uh, they were primary trainers for this event. And so they were, they're also working along this path of being trainers. Or in the combined forces of our two departments, it's pretty amazing to have three state certified trainers. Uh, most volunteer agencies have zero. And how many are in Eureka? Not in the whole zero. county. It's zero. So, I mean, to have three here is pretty, pretty an amazing thing. So, anyway. And that is Darren McKinney, the gentleman in the white hat on the right. And then, oh, hold it. No. Yeah, I was looking at that. <laughs> anyway, okay, starting on the left is Darren Short, and then Darren McKinney, and that's Ryan. And that's James Weiland from Crescent Fire, who's the other primary trainee. And then I wanted to note Tim DeVoe here on the left is the Crescent City Battalion Chief for CAL FIRE, and he acted as a safety officer for the three days and uh, did a tremendous job, and he's been a real asset to us. I saw him in Medford over the weekend, and without the fire stuff on, I almost didn't recognize yeah, him. <laughs> yeah, totally different looking guy. This is uh, the start of the fire on Friday night. I threw in just a few shots that were just fun. This is, you can see where they just laid the hose in. The engine had just arrived. They're just starting their attack on that fire. Some of the city firefighters actually inside the doorway of the burner building. People working on the outside. Inside, kind of almost inside. And this is the opening day on Saturday, I believe. And this is Ryan giving one of the briefings. I know some of you are there to listen to the briefings. They were quite extensive, a lot of safety stuff discussed, and uh, so everybody knew what they were doing and were on the same page. 
um, more of a similar briefing. Also in the background here are three Pelican Bay firefighters in the brighter yellow turnouts. Um, they're who Ryan uh, lives with a couple days a week in out there. Firefighters. Inmate firefighters and Pelican Bay fire engines and work out there, but are also available to us as uh, mutual aid. And we use them quite often because when everybody else is tired and worn out, those guys are still willing to keep on working. Especially if we go to Burger King and get food or something like that, they're all over it. So those are actual inmates? Yes. Oh. And they take part in the class just like every other firefighter. Mm -hmm. Can you talk into the mic too so we can get it on the recording? They, they work for days on that building to prep it for us. And yeah, it was, there was $80 in fees to take the class for the Pelican Bay Fire Department of which uh, the procurement process did not allow for. So there was a work exchange there where they worked probably in excess of 100 man hours for $80. So it was a pretty good deal, all the labor they did. Because we had to do things, interestingly enough, like even reverse the doors, because they all swung in. Oh. But in order to make it safe for the firefighters, we had to make sure they all swung out. Oh. We had to cover, break, take all the glass out of the, all the buildings, uh, cut holes, carpet, appliances, all that stuff had to be removed. So they did a lot of that work. It's a good life skill for when they get out, too. Yeah. There's some that do go on to firefighting careers, so that's a good thing. <coughs> This is the beginning of some of the training. They're doing ventilation training where they're actually learning how to cut roofs. Um, they're up on the roof, and they, that's one segment of the class is ventilation. This was the uh, fire behavior. I think I was standing with you during this until it got too smoky. <laughs> and uh, they build a fire to, to kind of teach the behavior of how it builds, how it works, so that they have a better understanding before they get inside. This is an entry team going into one of the buildings that's on fire. You notice they're down low, they crawl on their hands and knees because of the heat temperatures being a lot hotter at the upper level, a lot lower at the bottom. And the only real place that's safe is on the ground or on the floor. There's a team getting ready to go in and assist or um, actually I think they had a little, what was going on in this picture, they had some fire break out of the building. This team was rushing up to kind of knock it down before the building got away. This, this guy here is, uh, what's his Flynn? James, James, Flynn. James Flynn. He's a firefighter in Eureka and he's, this is the second time he's been up here teaching classes. He's full of energy and quite enthusiastic. Good instructor. Lots of pictures. This, we wanted to show some of the steps we took. This device was constructed by the city shop, John Cochran and friends, uh, in an attempt to deflect heat off of these phone lines, which are paper cables, we were told, and also these uh, windows that are 100-year-old uh, stained glass windows at the Methodist Church, which they were concerned about, but um, we talked to them how we were going to deal with it and stuff. And, uh, neither we had no problems with any of that. They were fine all the time. This shot shows it doesn't really show the fence, but it shows a narrow gap. There's a fence right in here, right at the edge mm -hmm. of this brush, and that fence is still there today. Yeah. And this building is gone, burned to the ground. So it's amazing. It's pretty amazing. It worked out that well. Just a shot. These are all city guys, Eric. You know. Uh, this is another attempt at uh, keeping those, this was on Sunday, keeping those phone lines uh, safe from the heat that uh, the building was doing. This is one of, this is one of the other safety officers that we had, assistant safety officers. How many safety officers were there? Probably on site. Six. Six total. So there was a lot of people looking in just after the, making sure everybody was doing everything right, everybody was in their gear properly. Everybody was accounted for. Some of the things that we have to do on real fires as well. And
And this is our enthusiastic food group. We fed all the firefighters uh, that showed up to do the training, uh, breakfast and lunch. And uh, some of the, most of the people helping were volunteers, so, including Ryan's wife and Kelly and Rosalind. Another shot at the food. <laughs> I was upset because he didn't take any cookies. I, yeah, that's a problem. This guy looks pretty healthy, though. I was on the end of the line. Nobody wanted cookies. <laughs> yeah, all that pizza and sandwiches and stuff before. <laughs> they got fed well. They got fed well. Yes. And here's Kelly with all the firefighters and Jean. Public information officer. Yeah. <laughs> Joe Borges there for two days, and Jason Wiley for one, used the backhoe, the city backhoe, to move things around and try and help keep heat off buildings and such. There's firefighters on top of the roof of the apartments next door, making sure that there was nothing going to burn up there. And that's a quick list of the participating agencies. And some special thanks that we want to make certainly the city of Crescent City for acquiring the building and allowing us to train on it. And Jean, who was a lot of help and support through the whole thing and acted as a PIO for the day. Eric Taylor, who did the bulk of the paper, paperwork, uh, at least getting it to the point of being able to burn it, getting the permit to burn it. Uh, I have, can't forget my wife, who was in charge of the food group and did the medical stuff one day. And anyway, Cindy Henderson, whoops, got Rosalind was always a big help and participated in the whole thing and helped with the food situation. Cindy Henderson there was there on Saturday and was a medic unit leader on Saturday. I already mentioned Jason and Joe and certainly John Cochran had a lot to do with it. And, uh, and we also had a, a really nice thing with the Crescent City Police Department explorers there kind of manning all the uh, road blockages and uh, they were very professional and did a great job. Before we get to that, any questions about the El Patio burn? I would just offer a comment that uh, I was uh, had the pleasure to be there on Saturday with uh, the city manager, Mr. Palazzo, uh, yourself, Steve, and Ryan, and council member Shalong. And to me, it was absolutely invaluable. And when you realize that these uh, various uh, firefighters' training came from Alameda and other points where they can't do those kinds of training down there in the city because uh, of the air quality control issues. And so I think everybody gained a lot from it and it was powerful. You know, I, to me, it far uh, uh, surpasses uh, any cost that's involved from what's gained, I think, from that process and in, in the training. So great job. Any other comments? I, I would echo exactly what Council Member Slurt said and um, adding that I was extremely impressed um, with the entire operation from A to Z. Um, and especially, you know, having Joe Borges and Tim Wiley, the work they did with the backhoe was <laughs> pretty uh, impressive in itself. Um, and I can't believe how much I learned. Um, I actually felt like I. You know, once I got there, I didn't want to leave because it was so interesting um, to watch everything from the fire behavior training to, um, you know, all the different drills and then the actual thing just going up and watching all of the surrounding structures being protected. I was amazed at how safe everything was, and I just think everybody did such a great job. And one more piece of blight gone, so, yeah. yeah. Council Member Westfall, any comments? Um, it was a very well orchestrated event. I was there Friday night, Saturday morning, uh, Sunday, and everything went off without a hitch. And it, it is because of the planning that was done. Uh, it was so well coordinated and everything. You thought about every single detail and any contingency of what could go on wrong. You you uh, prevented it, and it just was. It was very well done. So, um, one other group that we um, would want to thank would be all of the families besides Mrs. Chief. But um, Mr. Weir's uh, dad was there. Of course, he's a volunteer fireman too. And uh, But his uh, 
sister and her fiance were there and kids and people's families came out and it was very well supported and it was I think because you uh, advertised it planned it so well and then carried through and so thank you guys for doing that we're really excited about um, the investment that was made so well and it was an investment in the community too I mean the TOT dollars from hotel stays and you know those guys going out to dinner and um, you know whatever expenses they had while they were here so and they were I can't even tell you how many thank yous I got from the out-of-town firefighters yeah, most of the time they're paying big dollars for training and they're paying for their um, food and motel rooms and all this stuff so it's expensive to go to the training mm -hmm. for a lot of them but to be able to, but the reality for us is we needed that many people to make this work as you could well tell uh, there was certainly training going on but at the end when it was just going up we needed a lot of people to man hose lines and make sure everything was mm -hmm. safe and just do the, the work of the event you know? right and congratulations to Ryan for his successful event <laughs> yeah. Well, and to parlay off that too, that training that we did, just FYI, I mean, yeah, yesterday we ran two structure fires, uh, one at 3 a.m. and one at 7.30 last night, both where we were doing the same things we did here, going inside on burning buildings, going to the roof, cutting holes. Um, but all, you know, we did search and line, search and rescue, the whole thing. Wow. Yeah. So Do what? We thought we had people in the building on oh, the first right. one. Right. It turned out they weren't there, but you know, so anyway. we're using the skills. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah. Um, and then what I decided to call the third life of, of number seven, <laughs> we just wanted to show you this. Uh, number seven is a 1981 Ford Oxman that was bought in 81, to, and its life then was kind of almost a locker room on wheels. Gargatus drove to every call for 20 years <laughs> and uh, it, it carried all the turnout gear in, in it is what its purpose was well as things changed now more people have their gear at the station some carry it with them so there wasn't there wasn't as much need for that so it got kind of rerouted probably in the early 90s into uh, a rig that carried uh, uh, air systems to fill up our air bottles and uh, and extra gear we had in there, things like that. And then um, as the equipment changed, we didn't need the air thing anymore. We had it on another vehicle. And uh, it, it's kind of sat without too much use for a few years. Well, now the city shop has rebuilt it and they've done just an amazing job. But it's a porta potty, <laughs> lack of a better word. Uh, which is really nice. You can see the door here inside of it, and it uh, it allows a bathroom to be taken to a f emergency scene. Which you know, if we're there for 15 minutes, it's not necessary. But when we're there for 15 hours, it's real necessary. And uh, and it's uh, we used it that day. It's coming handy. It's got a sink and soap and towels and lights in it. It's got this really nice cabinet um, that we've put some like power bars and it carries water and kind of rehab stuff, some medical stuff in it. And then it's got this long bench so that it, if it was a real nasty night or something, people could actually be sat down there to rest or rehab or whatever needs to happen and get them out of the weather. We could put victims in it as well if we need to. Sometimes we have to do that um, just to get them out of weather. So I'd like to um, thank the shop for that. Yeah. They, they tremendous job and the other thing about this vehicle is it, it's the city vehicle it's available to the public works department if they needed if they had a water line break <coughs> at night and had to work non-stop well we can give them this they've got a bathroom or something you know or the police department if they have an investigation whatever it's, it's going to be a real asset not only to the city and the community we'll make it available if other departments have a long-term event we're, we're probably going to be anyway helping them so Stick the media in there so they don't get cold. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Thank and, you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Anything else that uh, our city manager would like to comment regarding this? You did a swell job yourself. Yeah, it's a pleasure watching uh, uh, being on site and I learned a lot as well. And 
Yeah, and kind of echoing everything that was said, it's a good asset to the community, and we moved a very blighted building out there. And, uh, and number seven, I think that's a very diverse uh, way to use our, our vehicles, and, and we want to use how that. Thank you. I think we should do it again soon. We have a few more properties we're looking at, so <laughs> we'll be back on that. All right. Moving on to continuing business, item number 12, consider, waive full reading, and adopt an ordinance entitled Ordinance Number 765, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Crescent City, amending the City of Crescent City zoning map for APN number 118-230-45. Way, Eric. Taylor. Recall uh, the applicant Bear Rumiano purchases property located at 820 F Street, kind of intersection of 8th and F Street. Uh, currently, the property is developed with a six unit apartment complex, and he requested to have the zoning changed from the current zoning, which is residential professional, to C1 to pretty much bring the entire block into the same zoning for possible future development and expansion of the. Any, I think this is uh, the same issue I need to recuse myself on. Is that, yeah. Sorry. For me, Otto, she's just a client. Any comments or clarifications? If not, I will open it up to public comment. Is there any public comment on this matter? Seeing none, I'll close public comment. And, uh, Madam Mayor, I'd move to approve uh, ordinance of the city uh, council of the city of Crescent City amending the city of Crescent City zoning map for APN 118-230-45. Second. <clears throat> Madam Clerk, could you please pull the, take the vote? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> council Member Westfall? Yes. Council Member Shalom? Excuse me. <laughs> council Member Slurt? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Ania? Yes. And Mayor Murray? Yes, thank you. And for the record, Council Member Shalong um, recused herself. And we will move on to item number 14, which is consider and discuss how to fill Council Members. Oh, I skipped 13. I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I got my. Um, Consider waive full reading and adopt an ordinance entitled number 766, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Crescent City amending the City of Crescent City zoning map for APN number 118-170-01. Recall this property is located at 681 H Street, uh, it's located right next door to the El Patio, which we just talked about. Uh, the applicant, uh, James Nichols, is in the process of selling the property. Uh, currently, the property is zoned C1, which is a commercial zoning, but they're unable to secure financing to sell the property. So they request that we take a look at that and possibly change the zoning. So upon going out inspecting that the property uh, became quite evident that the property actually would benefit from having a residential professional zoning. When you look at the character of the neighborhood, uh, the property itself, that house was built in 1904, where thereabouts. Uh, Several other properties in the area were built right around the turn of the century in that same time period. So in order to kind of preserve the, the character of the neighborhood, we proposed the zoning change to residential professional, which is a little stricter and it allows less uses, less commercial uses in the city. And did you guys have a conversation yet about changing the zoning on the entire block? Looking at the El Patio itself. Yeah instead of just doing the one little corner? Uh, we haven't got that far right now. So, because I mean, we do have other commercial, there's also a laundromat there and right. some other properties. So that'll go to the planning commission first, which by the way, we have three planning commissioners in the audience and I just wanted to give you public recognition for the work that you do for us. So thank you. Any questions or quorum? Are there any questions, other questions or clarifications? Okay. I will open this up for public comment. Is there public comment on this? I'm aware of something. My name is Richard Miles and I am a resident of the city. There is a 
home in that area that has a lot of historical value. And that's the little pink house across the street from, what is it, the Amaldi House or? McNulty. Yes, the McNulty House. My city has, doesn't have a historical district. And because those homes on H Street have, have an historical value and the majority of them are re residential, but at the same time, um, you have Stover Engineering, Laundry Mat, the El Patio. I think one time there was somebody that wanted to put a hairdressing place in. There is the old uh, chiropractor's office next to the uh, veterans hall that I believe my city needs, and my city planning, and the planning commission needs to look at that area and keep the majority of it residential. And the sections that are commercial definitely define them as commercial. Is there any other public comment on this matter? Seeing none, I'll close public comment and bring it back to the council. I'll move for approval of amending the ordinance of the City of Crescent City Zoning Map for APN number 118-170-01. I'll second that. Madam Clerk, could you please pull the vote? Yes, ma'am. Council Member Slurt? Yes. Council Member Shalong? Yes. Council Member Westfall? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Ania? Yes. And Mayor Murray? Yes, thank you. Motion carries unanimously. Now we'll move on to item number 14. Excuse me, Madam Mayor. I'm going to ask to be excused. I feel like I'm relapsing with this illness. I'm sorry, not feeling well. Sorry, Kenneth, but I didn't hear you. Yeah. Council Member Westfall is not feeling well, and she's leaving the meeting. Uh, we're on item number 14. Discuss, consider and discuss how to fill council member Slurt's remaining term of office, which expires in November 2012 after his resignation on January 5th, 2012, and take action as necessary. Uh, but a point of order, I, we had moved um, item number three to the end of the agenda. Do we need to accept the resignation letter before we do this? Um, that's essentially a formality okay. but if you want to do it that way it kind of makes sense that falls into order that way so you could do that or you could just keep you could just take it up yeah. okay well if it's just a formality we'll take it up at the end I just want to make sure we we're doing things properly right. so city manager and a mayor members of council yeah, I've outlined in the staff report basically you know, two ways in which you can proceed, you know, with the filling of the position. Uh, the recommendation uh, that I've outlined is to solicit uh, interest uh, from the community, you know, basically request an application, letter of interest, and have them uh, ha have interested people file that with the city clerk's office. Uh, I recommended a a few week uh, time period um, to come back to uh, be submitted by January 9th, 2012. Uh, that'll you know, give us adequate time to take a look at the interests, bring that back to the council meeting on the 17th of January, uh, where at that point I would recommend the council maybe schedule a, a special meeting to do interviews. And we decided on January 9th because it would be to have time to publish it in the local paper as well we can uh, I've talked to um, uh, Ms. Patch city clerk and I think we can start that publication right away absolutely okay and that should give adequate time to get the uh, notice it out okay all right um, okay. Uh, any comments or 
questions for clarification? Uh, I would absolutely uh, support the notion of uh, Mr. Plaza to uh, do an appointment versus a special election to save the cost to the city. Uh, in addition, uh, this has been done before. Mr. Ania was appointed uh, when Mr. Klodner uh, resigned. By the way, uh, he called today and sends his wishes to everybody. Uh, so uh, I think it's the right thing to do, an appointment, uh, and, and uh, I think it's a fair uh, process. Thank you. Anything else? Um, on the application questionnaire, um, I thought it might be um, important to add a couple things, uh, including experience on uh, any other similar boards or um, any kind of experience that would be comparable and also um, any financial and budgeting experience they might have. Are we going to ask them for a resume too? I thought we had discussed that, but it could be covered under item D, other information. Yeah, there is an application form that uh, was used last time with the supplemental questionnaire. I think that's all that was requested, but at you know, the discretion of the council, you can certainly ask for you know, either a resume or you know, a letter of interest which outlines. Uh, I think all of the above is good. Um, at this point, then, I will open it up for public comment. Is there public comment? Mr. Miles. This is the main reason why I decided to t attend tonight. I'm a deep believer in one man, one vote. I believe that I've been attending these meetings for about 10 years. Every time somebody resigns, we forget the, trill, the true concept of democracy, and we go through this horse race of appointing somebody. And what happens most of the time it gives the advantage to the person you appoint for the next election. And I'm sa saddened that Gerald has to leave, but I'd like to point out some facts. There, there is 10 months to the general election April, I mean January, February, March, April, May, there will be an election. That's four months. And I don't care how much it costs my city, there could be election at that time. What saddens me is that we could wait. If one person on this city council would get along and go along, unfortunately, I don't think I'll see that. I know that to break a tie, you need the fifth person. In some ways, that need in this short period of time is a sad comment on how my city government has worked for a number of years. I know you won't consider having an election in May, but the next time when the period is shorter and somebody resigns, I think you owe the community as a whole. Time's up. Can you wrap it up, please? Yeah. I think you owe the people to have an election. Thank you. 
Is there other public comment on this matter? Seeing none, I will close the public comment and bring it back to the council. I have a comments sure. I'd like to make. The, um, it's always nice to have an election if it's uh, feasible or financial. The election would cost us $20,000, money of which we don't have to spend. And so to doing the best thing for the city, for our residents, is to make an appointment as we've done in the past. The notion that a person has an advantage, take a look at me. I was appointed twice and lost twice, so that advantage doesn't work. <laughs> so that's a moot point. So if you had an election in June, which may cost less money, 30 days later that person would have to file again to run because the term is only until November. So that's another thing to consider. There's nothing wrong with appointments, and uh, it's not necessarily to break uh, a, a tie vote. It's to keep government going, and this is the way we've done it. And if we had the extra $20,000, I may say, yeah, we should have an election. But we don't have $20,000. We had to vacate a police officer position because we didn't have the money. We're going to have to do other things in our budget that our citizens aren't going to like, and I don't want to waste $20,000. I agree with you, um, but even if we had an extra 20 grand in spare change <laughs> um, to have to spend it when, for an election that would only last 10 months or six months um, probably wouldn't be fiscally responsible. Okay. So, uh, what's your pleasure? I'll move that uh, that we appoint consider this process and appoint a person to the council after going through the process outlined here by our city manager. I'll second that. And also um, maybe give a copy of the code of ethics to anybody that applies for them to review. And Rosenberg's rules of order, which we have on our agenda tonight. Is that sufficient? Mr. Brock, or should I, I think just we just need a directive, actually. It's not a motion. Who wants to start the solicitation to request application? Yeah, I think the way the ordinance reads, the decision to appoint or to call an election needs to be made in that 30-day window after the vacancy actually occurs. Okay. So but through direction tonight, you can start the process, get geared up to, uh, to do an appointment if that's your, your desire. And that's my motion, to start the process to request applications. But I think we just need a directive. Is that right? Directive to directive. the city manager? Yeah. yeah. So, no. And we're all in agreement here mm -hmm. okay. with uh, the added questions yes. that Council Member Shalong suggested. Okay, on to item number 15. Consider and approve the strategic plan, vision, mission, values, and goals. Mr. Palazzo. Mayor, members of the council, good evening. Gene Palazzo, city manager. I was very pleased with our strategic plan uh, workshop session that we had a few Saturdays ago on, on December 3rd. Uh, out of that, the city council um, uh, formatted the vision, mission, values, and three goals you know, for our organization. And I wanted to say a few words um, on the importance of strategic planning. Uh, to the city council, to staff, and, and, and you know, for the community. And what it does, it'll develop, us, develop a strategy that's going to assist us in our decision-making process that are going to help us allocate uh, our resources in accordance with the organization priorities. Uh, yeah, in a sense, it's going to keep us on track you know, when we go through you know, some difficult budget times that will, will most likely be coming up here in the next year. Um, and help you know me in working and assisting with staff. Uh, the next step after this process will be working with staff to put uh, objectives to those goals uh, that we'll bring back to the council in February. And then uh, with those goals, we'll put implementation measures that, which will be will come back to the council when we adopt our budget. So in a sense, it's very important uh, for us uh, to move forward. The I have outlined, you know, kind of the importance of the mission, vision, you know, value statements. I'm not going to read through that. 
attached is is what you know came up or what the council you know, formatted over the weekend and what I would request this evening is for the City Council to adopt uh, this mission vision values goals um, as is or we can um, you know, take a look and, and make it you know some changes uh, but adoption tonight will give us a solid foundation in moving forward uh, and bringing back those objectives to the council in February. Okay. I appreciate everybody's hard work. Uh, went uh, quicker than I expected. And appreciate staff uh, spending the time and participating and, and working through this with the council. Thank you. Comments or clarification for Mr. Plotzo? <laughs> I would just offer that it was a good uh, working tool for the city, and I think it would be good if it was posted on the website um, that the city's finally established and identified the goals and objectives, and now the challenge is going to be to marry the money with the ideas. Anything else? Well, this is uh, a pet pet um, project of mine so I'm thrilled that we are moving forward with it I think it is um, it'll be the guiding light for us we we do intend to have it on our website once we get the um, objectives it tied in with the goals with which will have a timeline and then um, our city residents can review it online or if you have questions you can always come in um, make an appointment and come in and see if you could talk to the city manager if you, about your questions and or you may come to a city council meeting once we get this whole thing put together and discuss it with us but um, right now is a good opportunity to interject ideal ideas and opinions and we're still tweaking it but the main thing is we have our vision which is the city of Crescent City will promote quality of life and community pride for our residents businesses and visitors through leadership teamwork and values and I can't think of a better way to get started than with a vision like that, so. Um, I was just going to comment that um, outside of just getting comments through um, the public meetings, um, that it is indeed our employees that will be doing this work and not just our department heads. And it might be um, valuable to get their input as well. You know, and I would appreciate that. And, and they will. We've already discussed that. All the, uh, actually, this information was discussed at our, uh, last week at our Next Generation meeting. I've requested that, you know, the, the employees carry this down to all levels of the organization. Uh, the objectives, I'll, I'll put a, you know, date together in the middle of January where the departments need to bring back, you know, three to five solid objectives that they'd like to accomplish you know, this next year. You know, some departments may not you know, fit in with you know, one of those goals, but we'll put objectives together and they need to carry that down to everybody in, in the organization needs to participate in that. And, you know, the but rather than saying carrying it down, <laughs> okay. I'd like to see the lower level employees have the opportunity to carry something back up. I, I agree with that. Great. I think you've done a lot of legwork with them. At, at all staff levels to get them involved and participate with this. Um, he did a lot of work. We had a lot of uh, city staff at the strategic planning meeting and um, so we're getting, getting the city staff completely involved and everything's tied to the budget with this so we can't have some pie in the sky idea without having money to implement. <laughs> yeah and when we come back uh, to the city council you know, for this next year's uh, budget, everything needs to tie with this strategic plan and we need to allocate resources accordingly. And did you have an opportunity to look at the plan that we put together um, with our previous city manager based on the goals that came out of the town hall meetings? I have, and that was. Part I just want to make sure those don't get dropped off. They have not. Great. Okay, so public comment on this? Did I, I haven't had public comment. I attended the workshop, and I want to thank the city manager for bringing 
an excellent person to this community to help you guys facilitate this. But I do have one concern. In, 19, in 1996, the city council kind of did the same thing. At that meeting, workshop you held, um, the previous material was read out loud at that meeting. And one of the things that impressed me that a previous city council wrote, and I hope it will be added to this one, that no city council would do any harm that would affect the residents of this city. And the reason why they did this, and I learned this after speaking to C. Ray Smith and Mike Scabuzzo, was that was the period of time that the city and the county were involved in the water wars. And that's when the city and the county went to court. Well, since that time, we have been getting along. But at the same time, in the future, there could be an incident that there could be a conflict between the city and the county. And I would hope at that time, the worry of the previous, I don't know, was in the mission statement or the goal, but there was, would be something said that no city council would do anything to harm the economic viability of the city. Thank you. Is there other public comment? Seeing none, I will close public comment. And I, I think it might be a good thing to read the values, uh, which touch on what Mr. Miles just said, but we've adopted, we, we'll, I hope that we will be adopting these values. We identified them at the plan, strategic planning meeting, but accountability, honesty and integrity, extra excellent customer service, effective and active communication, community partnerships, and fiscal responsibility. And I think that covers everything. All right. What's the council's pleasure? I'll move that we approve the uh, city's strategic plan, vision, mission, values, and goals. I'll second it. Any further discussion? Um, could you please pull the vote? Madam Clerk. Yes, ma'am. Council Member Shalom? Yeah. Council Member Slurt? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Enya? Yes. And Mayor Murray? Yes, thank you. And um, if the council agrees, I'd like to move um, Rosenberg's rules of order to the next agenda. Sure. Okay. And with that, I will move on back to item number three, which is to acknowledge and accept the resignation, sadly, of Council Member Charles Slurt, effective January 5th, 2012. Any comments? I don't accept it. Please. <laughs> Any public comment? Okay. So do we have a motion to accept? I'll move to accept. I'll second. Could you please pull the vote? Do you really have to vote on it? Uh, it just yeah. seems negative. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Council Member Slurt? Yes. Council Member Shalom? No. Mayor Pro Tem Ania? Yes. And Mayor Murray? Sadly, yes. Um, and before we move off of this item,
we would like to thank you for all your positive contributions and um, we'd like to recognize you for all that you did for the city so on behalf of the city of Crescent City we'd like to give Councilmember Charles Slurt this gavel it says in appreciation of your years of dedicated service as mayor and council member of Crescent City 2008 to 2012 say this is uh, not the way I planned for things to be and uh, I'm honored uh, to receive this uh, and I'll uh, treasure it but I also appreciate working with my colleagues uh, and our city staff uh, and leadership and the community Bill yourself also um, it's uh, had challenging times, and uh, I think uh, good things have happened. So I'm happy to have been able to serve the public and be a part of this process. Um, I also need to thank my wife for a lot of sacrifices. Um, but I would also offer that uh, in the last three plus years, there's been a lot of people that have processed through this room and a lot of people in our community have a lot of opinions about a lot of things. <laughs> and uh, I encourage that uh, input and participation. Uh, but I guess my challenge would be uh, for the community to uh, make a personal resolution to get more involved in the community. Um, because uh, it's about making a contribution, putting something on the line, and trying to build a better community. So um, I would challenge people to consider very seriously public service. Um, I think you'll come away with a different feeling when you've sat on the other side and um, heard the people. So thank you very much. Mr. Slurt, losing you as a council member is going to be a great loss to the city and to this council. And so my, my no vote <laughs> is, is purely just because I, I really um, am saddened about your departure. Thank you so much. All right. We have work to do. We do have work to do. do legislative we? matters. Do we have any legislative matters to consider? Please. We thank you for getting your, the city manager, um, thank you, Jean, for getting your report to us with our board packets. Appreciate it. And all the time that you take to get that information to us. Um, reports, concerns, referrals from council? Mr. Slurt? Sure. Um, the past couple of weeks I attended uh, with my colleagues uh, the Elk Valley Rancheria Utilities Ad Hoc Committee and uh, also uh, the uh, attended the IGRC meeting with Mr. Palazzo and uh, Mr. Renfro and others and then uh, was uh, happy as I mentioned to attend the uh, El Patio uh, Motel Burn uh, I think it was a huge success and then uh, I attended uh, last week the Del Norte Solid Waste Management Authority uh, joint uh, board meeting. Thank you. Well, I attended the uh, Solid Waste joint meeting also and also went to the El Patio 
Blackburn and actually um, didn't have any other meetings. So close to the holidays. Council Member Schlong. Um, I also attended the Solid Waste Management Authority board meeting. I wanted to thank um, Mr. Palazzo and um, Mr. Plack for being there as well. Um, I attended the Elk Valley Ranchery Ad Hoc Committee meeting. Uh, I attended the Wild Rivers Community Foundation reception. Um, attended the El Patio uh, burn and actually was very honored to be there. Um, and we have our next airport terminal design uh, meeting this week. So I'm excited uh, to continue down that path. And I just wanted to wish everybody a Merry Christmas. Thank you. I uh, also attended the El Patio and as we said, it was a huge success. The, I attended the Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors meeting. We elected new officers. Congratulations to incoming President Mary Foote. I also attended the Joint Solid Waste uh, Super Committee, I guess we're calling it. As <laughs> um, I attended the Your Salon uh, Chamber Mixer, was was uh, quite a uh, nice soiree. And also the gallery's um, opening for new artists. Um, that was the ninth on the ninth. And um, I'm just making the announcement that we will continue to use um, Charles alternate for the committees that he has been assigned until we get our appointee on the city council and then we'll make a new committee appointments. And I'm also would like to wish everyone happy holidays. May they be peaceful, safe, and healthy. We'll adjourn. <laughs>